Hi, I'm Ash from Droning On and welcome back. In our Dobby Part 1 review, we unboxed and inspected it. We promised Part 2 to look at the app and so here it is. Part 3 is en route so hit that subscribe button now. So that's the hardware, now let's take a quick look at the app and also how to update the firmware on the Dobby. As promised, it's finally time to look at the Dobby app and also we'll cover firmware updates. So I'm using an Android platform here with my Samsung S8 Plus. The first thing we're going to do is go into the Play Store. You then need to search for the app, which is called Do Fun. What a great name. Now I've already got it installed, but if you haven't, all you need to do on this screen is click install and it will take a few minutes to download and set up. Now we're not gonna launch the app just yet because we need to first of all turn on Dobby so that it can start emitting its Wi-Fi access point. So press the button on top of Dobby, hold it down for a few seconds, you'll hear the fan start up. You can then release the button and wait for it to boot up. After a few seconds, it'll make a startup tone so that you know it's ready. And then the light on the rear will probably start flashing blue and that's whilst the drone is trying to either get an optical lock on the ground or a GPS lock, but we're not gonna worry about that just yet because we're currently indoors. So now that Dobby has started up, we're going to connect to its Wi-Fi access point. So launch your Wi-Fi settings, and give it a few seconds just to search for new networks and you'll see Dobby listed there. Press on it to connect and type in the default password, which is zero tech. Then press connect, and within a few seconds, you should be connected to Dobby. You'll get a warning on your phone probably to say that internet may not be available, and that's because you're no longer connected to your home Wi-Fi network. And of course, we can't get internet access through Dobby because it's a drone. Click back and launch the app. The first screen is normally an advert for their latest products and then you get to a social feed which shows other videos and photos from users. But of course, you're not gonna get any results there because we're not on the internet. So really this part of the app is only useful when you're not connected to Dobby and when you do have an internet connection. We're gonna press the blue button in the middle to connect to Dobby when we press start. So first of all, this is our first entry into the app. We've got a bit of a tutorial here to tell us what each of the icons do. Running across the top from left to right, we've got the Wi-Fi signal strength. That's quite useful. Keep an eye on that when you're flying, of course. Next across is distance, which at the moment reads naught meters because we're right next to it. Next, we've got altitude, which is minus 0.5. Ignore that. Of course, it's not really gonna be accurate until we take off. Then battery level, another one to keep an eye on. Of course, if you're flying away from yourself, be sure to turn around and fly back before you get to 50%. Otherwise, you may not get your drone home. Then we've got the flashing navigation icon in red, which means it's trying to obtain a GPS signal, but at the moment we're indoors, so of course we're not gonna get a GPS signal. And finally, on the right-hand side, flying status, which is a little bit like the DJI app. It tells you the drone's current status and the fact that we don't currently have a fixed location. And then top right, there's a settings button, which we'll go through later. On the left hand side, we've got the takeoff button, which is an auto takeoff. When you press that, you'll get a confirmation. You'll also set the angle of the camera and then the drone will take off and ascend to one and a half meters automatically and stay in a hover pattern. And that's pretty much it. So right now we've got a live feed from the drone, which if I pick it up and move it around, you can see there it's quite smooth actually. You can set the resolution of the live feed, but don't set it too high because by doing so, you'll reduce your range and bandwidth. Because remember, you still need to utilize that Wi-Fi bandwidth for the control. So if I just put the phone in front of it, you can see there's about 200 milliseconds of latency there, I would say, from the point at which we move the drone to seeing it on the screen, which isn't so bad. And of course, this isn't a high-speed racing drone, so we're not overly worried about speed. Now, by picking up the drone, you can see we've got the optical flow location fixed. And that means because it's now off the ground, it's got an optical flow location pinpointed. That means that if we launch indoors now, it's going to be able to maintain hover on the spot. So you're getting a lovely live feed of my hotel room right now. And the first thing I'm going to do is calibrate the drone because you can see that we've got some magnetic field environment interference. So press settings top right, and then we've got the calibration screen here. 
Press start and it warns you that you must open the arms of the drone, which we'll do now. Then press I know and then press start. Now you can rotate the drone on its own, but I highly recommend standing on a level surface, holding the drone level and then rotating around with the drone as so. If you're not holding Dobby perfectly level, the light on the rear will flash rapidly. Adjust your hold and then when correct, the light will stay solidly lit and you can start rotating slowly. But get it wrong again and the flashing will resume. A bad calibration can lead to crashes, so be sure to get this right. Next, you'll be prompted to calibrate Dobby vertically, so rotate the drone around holding it with the camera facing downwards. Similar to the first part of the calibration, you must again be sure that you're holding Dobby perfectly vertically, using the rear LED again as a guide for if you're doing it correctly. Keep rotating until the app tells you that it's completed and the LED will start to flash slowly. If you are in any doubt about the calibration performed, do it again and I recommend that you calibrate the compass before every first flight of the day or calibrate it again if you've moved to a new location throughout the day. So within a very short amount of time, we've now got 11 GPS satellites already acquired. Remember that Dobby Ilsa has GLONASS, so it's a combination of GPS and GLONASS technology. We've still got the poor magnetic field warning being shown, and that's because I've put the Dobby on the windowsill outside this hotel room that I'm in today. Now I won't be flying it here, but of course the windowsill has metal in it. So just be wary of wherever you are flying this drone to make sure that you don't have any interference such as that before you take off. As a general rule, I recommend only ever flying when you've acquired at least 10 or 11 satellites. Don't fly on anything less because the accuracy is far reduced. So with the drone essentially ready to fly, we're just gonna have a quick look through the settings menu. So press the button top right, which looks like a little cog. Of course, we've got the calibration option, which we've already reviewed and used. The next option down on the left is the flight control method. So if we press on where it says sticks, we can choose from three different methods here. We've got motion sensitivity, which essentially is tilt mode, or as it's also called in some drones, gyro mode. This is basically where you tilt and hold the phone and using the phone tilt controls the drone. So it's nice for beginners, but it's also a bit of an inconvenience because you've also got to use the controls on screen whilst you're tilting the phone. That can be a bit of a pain. Sticks is the method that I like most. On the left, we've got American operator and on the right, we've got Japanese operator. All that basically does is switch between mode one and mode two. I prefer the American operator version because it's essentially mode two. The other benefit of this mode is that it doesn't matter where you put your fingers on the screen. So no matter where I put my finger on the left, the controls for rudder and throttle automatically move to that location, which is really good. Same with the aileron and elevator controls as well on the right. They both move so I don't have to keep looking at the screen to make sure the drone is doing what I want it to do. The final mode is safe sticks, which is another variation, but it does mean that the controls don't move to where your fingers are. It's quite irritating because you need to look at the screen to be sure that you're pressing where the actual controls where the actual control sticks are. So I'd recommend against using that mode and I would personally stick with the mode called sticks. The next option down is for the shooting modes. So we've got three different options here. Camera direction. This basically determines whether the controls are reversed or not. And this is for the selfie fans who are new to drone flying. If you set this mode to selfie, when the drone is facing you, the control left moves the drone left. Whereas of course with proper conventional drone controls, pressing left when it's facing you would make the drone move right. The problem with this mode is that when you then turn the drone away from you, the controls are opposite. So it's not very logical. I would instead stick with find a view, which basically means the drone moves wherever you tell it to move in a logical direction. The next option along is snap photo vibration. And this one's very simple. All it means is that when you take a photo, it will vibrate the phone. So a bit of a pointless one there. The next option along is mute app. And again, that's very self-explanatory. It just simply turns off all the sounds from the app so that when you take a photo, you don't get the shutter sound. Looking to the next option on the left hand side, we've got the Wi-Fi settings. So if you press remote the Wi-Fi of the drone, which doesn't make a lot of sense, you'll get the option to change the SSID emitted from the drone, as well as setting a new password. That may not be a bad idea actually, just to stop anybody else from connecting to your drone. 
The other option there is to switch the signal and you can choose between 5G or 2.4. Now 2.4 does give better range, but 5G gives better bandwidth. And it's also a cleaner frequency because there are less Wi-Fi networks currently using it. So it's a bit of a trade-off and it's probably a good idea to test both and see which suits the area in which you're flying. But for range, definitely go for 2.4 gigahertz. And also if you have an older mobile phone, you'll need to use 2.4 because it probably doesn't have five gigahertz. Finally on the left hand side, the three dots let you manage the firmware of the device. So we've got three options across the top, flight controller upgrade, OS upgrade, and removable storage. Flight controller upgrade, we're currently running 2.37. For the OS, we're running the current version, which is actually from 2016 in June, which is quite old, and hopefully Dobby will bring out an update soon for that. But the flight controller generally gets firmware updates quite often, and it's a very simple process. You simply click upgrade and away it goes. So that's it for the settings. We're gonna return back to the live feed and just look at the other settings that we have here. So now back to the main screen on the app. The button underneath the auto takeoff on the left hand side is allowing you to select the auto modes. Pressing that now isn't going to let us do anything because we're not currently in flight. But you can see we've got short video. Now this basically is the flyaway feature and it's really cool. You basically hover the drone near you, pointing towards you, press the short video button and you can then choose between 10, 30 or 60 seconds of flyaway and also the angle at which it will fly away. So basically it's a selfie shot and it records video whilst doing so. Very cool feature that Dobby just introduced and it works quite nicely. The next option along is orbit under GPS positioning. What that does is Dobby will fly around the target using GPS, which obviously is not gonna necessarily keep the target in sight because it's just using GPS. That's why you might then consider instead using the next option, which is orbit under target tracking. That uses optical flow to watch the target and analyze the image that Dobby's capturing and try to keep that object in the middle of the shot. It works fairly well, we'll try that during the flight test. The next option is target tracking, which is a little bit like DJI's active track, but perhaps not quite as successful. Again, we'll test that during the flight test. Then the option is face tracking. Now this actually works fairly well, although it doesn't necessarily maintain a lock on the face very well. But we'll test that during the flight test and show you just how it works. Pano video is basically a very slow 360 rotation of the Dobby drone and it's fully autonomous. Voice command is the only option that's actually enabled right now, but essentially you can tell Dobby to do various things by using your voice, but let's face it, you've got the controls and buttons right in front of you, so I can't quite imagine why you'd want to speak to the drone. And finally, there's the return home option, but you don't need to go into the intelligent flight modes button to see that option. The auto takeoff button instead transforms into an auto land button, which makes it much easier. On the right hand side we've got a toggle to set between video or photo mode and there's a shutter button below there to take a photo and also to start and stop recording. And when you take a photo you then get a small preview of it in the bottom right hand corner. Just looking through here you can see some of the photos I've been taking over the past few months whilst testing my Dobby. And I must say the photos are where Dobby really excels. They are great quality. Here's a photo that I took recently during a visit to a camping and barbecue area whilst visiting Sweden. Very cool and it's nice that you can view the photos immediately via the app. But do bear in mind that these are not high resolution at the moment. This is a quick preview. Just above the photo preview button we've also got settings for the camera. So if we press that you can see the first option here relates to photos. It's got single shot, burst shot and timed shot which is quite nice. Under the parameters tab, we've got white balance adjustment, so that's for different lighting conditions, but generally I think you're probably better off just leaving that on auto. We've also got EV, which is essentially exposure, so that's to adjust the exposure, so it's actually getting a little bit dark here in Vienna at the moment, so I can put the exposure up a little bit to brighten up that image. And there's also preview resolution, so when you take a photo or a shot, you can change the resolution of the preview that the Dobby app gives you. I'm gonna set that to 720p. And then finally, there's a setting relating to video, which is EIS, and that's electronic image stabilization. That's key for capturing good video shots with Dobby because it doesn't have a gimbal. 
EIS stabilizes the image by basically capturing in 4K and then panning and scanning the image to try and stabilize it. It actually does quite a good job and I'll show you that during the flight test. The app interface and features are getting better and better with each release, but there are a few improvements that I'd like to see to make it a more rounded app. It's not currently possible to manually set the home point for return to home. It would be very useful in some scenarios to be able to do so, mainly for peace of mind that Dobby will return where you expect it to. There are currently no photo or video resolution settings. Both are currently fixed at 1080p, but we are told by Zerotech that Dobby is 4K capable, so give consumers the option to capture at that resolution without EIS if they desire. EIS can only be turned on once video recording is active. That's a bit of a pain and it would be more efficient if EIS was either on or off globally. The Dobby controls are proportionate, but I'd like to see the introduction of a tripod mode like the DJI drones. The controls are still a little bit too sensitive when trying to capture a nice slow pan, so this extra mode would make that much easier. And finally, there are too many unnecessary clicks within the app. Just to get connected to Dobby, you have to click skip on the front page, then click the blue circle, and then click start, and it's a bit of a hassle. Also, reduce clicks for the calibration feature to make it quicker to use. If you have any suggestions to improve the Dobby app, please comment with your thoughts below. So that's the Dobby app as it stands today. The current version that we've just been looking at is actually version 2.2.1, which was updated on the 6th of August. That's not long ago, and as I said in the first part of this review series, the Dobby app is updated regularly, as is the firmware. So I suspect there are more flight modes to come with this little drone. So I hope that this part two review has been useful for an insight into the app. In part three, we'll be fully flight testing the Dobby, and I've been carrying Dobby around with me for the last month, taking it to Sweden and also today in Vienna. So hopefully I'll have some nice footage to showcase and show you in that flight test. Click that subscribe button now, and of course give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed this review, and please comment below with your thoughts. Thanks very much for watching.